Tim Belder is a Newell native graduating from Newell High School. He started post-secondary education at Black Hill State College, and by the time he graduated in 1990, it was Black Hill State University. He worked for local Northern Hills newspapers and the Rapid City Journal for 20 years before moving to Powder River Energy Electric 11. He lives in Sundance with his wife, Jerry, his oldest daughter and son attend Sheridan College, and the youngest daughter attends Sundance High School. Tim has researched various aspects of area history, some famous and some not so famous. Ranging from the 1976 Indian Wars to the Titan Missile Program in the early 60s, in between. He is a member of the West River History Conference Board of Directors. Please welcome Tim Belder. Well, thank you. It's nice to see this group gathering and doing history in any way you can. It's always good to keep that stuff going. Um, I'll just kind of dive in. If I go too fast, somebody raise your hand. I'm okay with that. But this is a story that I kind of stumbled on, as I normally do, doing something else. So um, doing a, a story on new windows at the Catholic Church up in Lee. The priest mentioned something, and I took an interest. And so I dug a little deeper and then met some people along the way. And so that's been about a 20 year adventure here. So I'll just kind of start off and I'll get going. I have several slides, but I zipped through them pretty fast. So, um, so this is the hundredth year since this murder occurred and um, it's still an unsolved uh, murder. So um, chilly autumn nights had descended once again on the Black Hills in October 1921. The chances of an overnight snowfall were very good on the night of October 25th, 1921. So many hours of the morning of October 26th, Reverend Arthur Belknap buttoned his overcoat and left his rectory residence at St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Lee. The man was seeking a priest to administer the sacrament of extreme unction or last rites on a person that was near death. But Father Belknap didn't know that it was he who was near death, and it was a murder plot that was in the air that cold October. Here we go. First glitch of the mission. Uh, earlier that day, Father Belknap had led a fairly routine life. He had heard compliments on his Sunday sermon when he stopped at a store in downtown Reed to buy some cigarettes. He was the diocesan chancellor and secretary and met with his superiors at the church, which was the headquarters of the Diocese of Western South Dakota. Father Belknap's parents, Emory, Rectory, where, uh, Emory was the handyman and Ella was the cleaning lady. Father Belknap was a well-known figure about town in much of the northern Black Hills, having served as a priest in Belfouche, Vale, and Spearfish communities. He was a charismatic figure who commanded tremendous respect and admiration, and the priest carried a triple threat of characteristics that endeared him to Catholics. He was well-educated, had an engaging personality, and was active in leading reform efforts in the Lead community. In 1921, Lead was a modern city with all the trappings and uh, uh, conveniences such as electricity, indoor plumbing, telephones, train service, and lots of money to go around. The Home State Mining Company in the heart of Lead was the largest gold producer, a good wage at the mine, enough to support families in the town that was packed with immigrant neighborhoods and businesses. The work at the underground mine was lucrative but hard. Many men lasted only a short time, often earning enough money to move on to easier work elsewhere. Others built their fortunes uh, for ideas of owning a farm or business. It was no Father Belknap sought to create a better society than the one that existed in the 
He saw young miners spending their time in Devon playing cards and engaging in <laughs> sinful nightlife that set poor examples for the impressionable teens in Lee. Um, the mine required workers to serve out their shifts even on Sundays when the churches in town would like to have families get gathered in the Bishop John J. Lawler allowed Father Belknap to lobby for his parishioners to have Sundays off. The mine officials, who were already uh, concerned about unionizing, uh, resented uh, Belknap's proposal, primarily because it put the thought in the minds of some of the workers that there might be a higher priority than working for home state. All good priests are in the business of the saving's journey that he must not only accept that he will be praised, but he will also be despised. Neither of those aspects of the priesthood affected Father Belknap. So this is a photo of uh, one of the operations just a couple months before the murder in August 1921. So that kind of give you a little glimpse of how things looked. So um, when I give this, here we go. This is an example of Father Belknap's zeal. He organized, organized a mini invasion of Wyoming on Easter Sunday morning, April 7th, 1918. He brought the entire choir from Spearfish for a sung mass at the small church in Beulah. This is no small task. Remember, the good priests and the choir would have been coming off a long uh, pre-Easter services on Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and midnight. And Easter to travel to a little town with tired voices and bodies was a huge sacrifice of volunteerism. <coughs> Father Belknap rewarded the choir with a special picnic lunch on Sand Creek after the service. And that photo was before 1920. Um, so anybody know what was going on in 1921 nationally that might have been kept law enforcement interested? about Native Americans in Oklahoma that were under a siege uh, reign of terror. That's probably not what you're looking at. That was 1921. Oklahoma was illegal. Prohibition. And that prohibition was, was a big deal. Was a big and it had just taken uh -huh. place about a year and a half earlier where the law enforcement was really cracking down. I'll get into that in a little bit, but it's not in the presentation, so i got to remember. Uh, uh, in June 1921, Bishop Bush, who preceded Bishop Lawler, uh, they, they were told that there was no place for a separate Catholic high school in town, despite their efforts to create one. Bishop Bush, in 1914, openly protested the home state mine's hostile workplace toward Catholic miners uh, who requested time off to ascend, attend Sunday Mass. Bush even moved out of lead and set up residence it's a rapid city mining enterprise that never materialized, but the tone was set for each side against each other. And it was mentioned that Homestake liked to blow their whistles during mass, just to <laughs> get under the skin of the priests. Um, there was a cloister of nuns who worked in a Catholic hospital and elementary school, but their lives were generally segregated from the community. But Father Belknap was an exception. His reputation drew folks to him, and although it was never stated publicly, there was a fear that Father Belknap would reach celebrity status and would bring awesome public support for his initiatives. It was shortly before October uh, 1921 that Father Belknap proposed the construction of a community center geared toward providing activities for youth, all youth, in the lead area. Powerful men in the community, mine officials, competing clergy, business leaders, and members Anti-secret societies of various sorts had formed in the lead area after World War I and were active at the time of Father Belknap's murder. Many of these were of ethnic origin because of the variety of segregated European immigrants made lead in their home. So as we go further, if you have sensitivities about um, uh, Freemasonry, communism, the mafia, uh, I'm going to touch on all those. So 
be ready. Um, around 3 a.m. on Wednesday, October 26, 1921, Father Belknap again uh, answered the door, and apparently as a man was seeking this sick call and at an address near Poor Man Gulch, near where the roundhouse is located today. The rectory is located on Seaver Street. The same priest must have questioned the call for help since he was dragged out in the middle of the night on three wild goose chases in the past month. So is this another false alarm? An alternative scenario is this. Perhaps Father Belknap heard the smashing of his car's ignition in the garage and came out to investigate. Caught in the act, the killer may have improvised, saying he was trying to get help for a dying man. It is an up of the essence. Father Belknap immediately went to the garage to fetch the car. Something was wrong with the car. It was a Studebaker, but that wasn't the reason. Uh, the ignition uh, workings didn't turn and were jammed or something. So Father Belknap and the man set out on foot for Poor Man Gulch. On the way, the priest and his escort met up with Arthur Miller, a mine worker who was going home from his shift. Miller pointed them to the after that, Father Belknap's fate was sealed. His escort dropped back a few paces and allowed Father Belknap to walk ahead of him. The man pulled out a hammer and struck the priest in the back of the head. The priest was dazed and staggered, but stayed on his feet. However, the man pulled a pistol and fired at least five times, with one of the bullets going through the priest's heart. Some men at the Bertolero boarding house heard the shots and scrambled outside. Down on the road, dead. They could hear shouting in the trees nearby, but couldn't make out what was said or where it was coming from in the darkness, because it obviously echoes pretty good. Mm -hmm. On the hills. The police investigation ensued, but the trail never really heated up as to who killed the priest and why. Police searched the area, inquired with anyone that might know, and were eventually tipped off. Later, the boarding house made Elizabeth Ferretto, who found a 45 caliber pistol, some bloody gloves, and a hammer in Andrew Rolando's room in the Bertolero boarding house. Although those were separate pieces of evidence, police were now looking for Rolando for at least an explanation. In talking with others who knew Rolando, authority against Rolando was seen in Lee the morning after the murder, stopping by a store to visit with acquaintances and following up on travel plans he had made a few days earlier. Rolando had promised a young lady he would give her a ride to Great Falls, Montana, because he was heading for Chicago, where his father uh, lived. That morning, he told the lady's friends that his trip was canceled, but he provided money for a train ticket. Instead, Rolando was seen Walker Inglewood, and he told a couple train workers that he was going to see a place that he hadn't seen before at a location further south. He was never officially seen or heard from again. At this point, there is only follow-up questioning and witnesses. Who could have possibly give some background about Rolando and his activities in the days and hours prior to the murder? People knew Rolando to be an amorous man for the men. He asked various girls out on dates but was often rejected. He accompanied various peers on outings to Deadwood, where they were known to play cards and have dinner at friends' homes. So none of the witnesses ever heard Rolando speak ill of Father Belknap or really give the priest much thought at all. That morning after the murder, Rolando stopped by Ricky's mercantile store and claimed to be unaware of the previous night's murder. Should have been impaled with a red-hot poker. Rolando barely responded, muttering something to the effect that, well, they can't blame me. Several false leads were reported, claiming to see Rolando at Edgemont, Leavenworth, Kansas, or Chicago, even Sheridan, Wyoming. None of them panned out. If Rolando was killed shortly after the murder, then it would be obvious that a conspiracy was afoot. The common tactic is to kill the assassin. 
as it is determined that the killer stood at least a couple feet away when he fired the pistol. Three shells were found on the ground next to the body. While men with badges huddled and fanned out in search of clues, civilians in lead were crestfallen. There were glorious tributes written about Father Belknap in the lead Daily Call and other newspapers, and the immediate reaction was sadness and anger. This was a community-wide sentiment. After the murder, but for years later, local Knights of Columbus, a group that was kind of the tip of the spear against uh, Freemasons and the KKK offered a $1,500 reward initially and then upped it to an unlimited amount about a month later. Um, and the Knights said that the murder must have been a personal targeting of Father Belknap, but not a general hatred of Catholics. Leeds Business District shut down on a Tuesday. People jammed the church for Father Belknap's Requiem Mass and lined up the streets as his casket carried the was carried to a train where his sorrowful parents accompanied the body to the family cemetery in Dubuque, Iowa. Bishop Lawler denounced the slaying as a dastardly deed which challenges the community and the whole priesthood. Reports held that Belknap's supporters were growing in papers. Bishop Lawler implored citizens to refrain from any violent actions of revenge. Another large gathering was present for the internment comprised of many priests and colleagues of Father Belknap. Conflicting statements immediately after the killing and in the following years lend suspicion as to whether a group of people were involved in the planning of the murder. With the rumors about a motive for the killing, the Freemasons and KKK members immediately floated the idea that Father Belknap was involved in an illicit affair with a married blonde <laughs> whose husband killed the priest in a crime of passion and then dumped the body. Uh, the rumor stated that Father Belknap was caught in bed and shot and then they dumped the body over there by, um, on Poor Man Gulch. And all these rumors were quickly had bullet holes in it. He was wearing the coat when he was shot. Footprints of the scene indicate he was killed where he lay, and the body wasn't dumped there. More rumors surfaced about other things, but none of them were substantiated. And um, everyone that knew Father Belknap spoke very highly of him, including Pope Pius XI, who especially sent a papal crucifix to Father Belknap's family in honor of this was a dodgy character. Um, you probably know Chuck Rambo, uh, local KKK expert, said that the Klan likely floated these rumors in hopes of smearing the priest and the local diocese and would lend some credence to their crime and build the KKK's reputation as a community hero. Uh, the public outcry and denial of the rumors forced the Klan to retreat from their uh, position and stay in the shadows. Masons had held a tight grip on the home state organization, offering a double reason for a mind to want Father Belknap out of the way. Rolando worked at the 900 foot level of the mine and would have been a ready made assassin from their stable of employees. By their nature, secret organizations fuel conspiracy theories because their business is not public. The Catholic Church and Masons have been odd since the French Revolution. and the churches in the late 18th century and the early 19th century. Uh, Rolando was believed also to be part of a gang of characters loosely affiliated with the Italian mafia, known as the Black Hand. The Pope had exiled Black Hand members out of Italy for their criminal behavior. Almost immediately, the accepted train of thought was that more than one person was involved in organizing the car's ignition was smashed with a blunt instrument, possibly the same hammer used to bludgeon Father Belknap, possibly the same hammer found in Rolando's room. The three prior false alarm sick calls now look like test runs en route to the murder. It is rumored that a nest of Black Hand members harbored near Cambria, Wyoming, on the side of the Black Hills, would have been an opportune strike. 
striking point. However, the Italians were never known to seek revenge against Catholic priests. At best, Rolando was an aspiring gang member who might have been motivated to enhance his resume with a murder. Other previous Black Hand activities against priests at the time were kidnappings, not murders. Some investigators hinted that Orlando was hiding in eastern Wyoming, which would have been the same general hangout uh, as the Black Hand. The local sheriff in Weston County, which is Newcastle, did a raid uh, on one of the camps over there in Cambria, and it was a prohibition raid or bootleggers. And so they did raid one of the camps over there, but it wasn't obviously connected with this murder from what I could find out, but there was a shootout. Um, so Bella Dodd started this conversation and subversive communist leadership worked in parallel to subvert many institutions in the 20th century. While some of us know the subversion attempts in the U.S. government, <laughs> academia, news media, and entertainment, few know about the subversion attempts against the Catholic Church. In the years prior to and during World War I, Russian Bolsheviks, Lenin and Stalin, weren't satisfied with just toppling Russia's monarchy. From 1918 to the early ex murdering priests and nuns as part of the early purge by communist revolutionaries. <clears throat> During that time, most of the murders occurred at night, with bodies of the clergy found shot or drowned the next morning. At the same time, they launched an initiative to weaken Western democracies by weakening the, weakening the strongest institutions. In the early days of the conspiracy, would the communists have been impatient enough to kill an American priest? Was Father Belknap aware of this plot against the church? Bella Dodd unveiled what she knew of the plan in the 1950s as she talked in detail about how communist infiltrators worked their way into American seminaries in the 1920s and 1930s with the intention of becoming young priests. Then these young priests would become old bishops and cardinals by the 1960s, secretly bringing in more and more communist recruits over their career. Castro received aid and comfort from mountain Jesuits in Cuba during the revolution in 1960. <coughs> the decline of the church's influence in American society and politics over the past century is, is also an obvious uh, sign that something has changed. Um, I do want to thank Father Belknap's relative and passionate researcher, Tom G. Ryan. He has now passed away. Uh, Father Belknap's dedication was his ultimate undoing. One of the false alarms, the priest drove around for hours looking for this bogus address, eventually giving up at daylight. The killers now knew that the priest would go out, but they couldn't have him driving the car. They would need him on foot where they could easily, he could be easily disposed of. The murderer captured the attention of folks around the country who speculated and chattered about it for decades. One voice that remained silent from the day of the murder to the present is that of Belknap's employer, the local Catholic diocese. Bishop Lawler took, and he's pictured in the center here, um, took no leadership whatsoever in the matter. He allowed the authorities to conduct the investigation. He allowed others to make unchecked public statements about murder chief Omera, but withdrew from the matter entirely and went to his grave after World War II, holding silence about Father Belknap. Was he taking the wrong course of action? Perhaps not. Um, Bishop Lawler's priests and nuns were already working in hostile conditions before the murder. If Bishop Lawler knew who the killers were, he would have known the motive. Uh, this motive would have sent the desired message to be in danger. If Father Belknap's activities were allowed to continue, the bishop entered robbery as the scant file for his uh, murder. This was a baseless ruling probably hatched between Chief Romera and Bishop Lawler to settle the matter and attempt to quell all the conspiracy theories. If it was a robbery, it was a robbery of what? The priest was carrying only the weapon. 
as in Saturday, that had no earthly monetary value, and they were still on him after the murder. If robbery of the car was the motive, why would the thief destroy the ignition and make the vehicle undrivable before being discovered by Father Belknap? So thank you, Dr. Tom Ryan, for these insights. It really helped uh, from his family side of things. Either way, the diocese experienced a time of relative peace and freedom following the murder to evangelize the community, but also be safe from harm. You can't save souls when you're dead. So the Catholic high school was established in Lead. Uh, Protestant and Catholic relations improved in the community and the Black Hills town and beyond. The diocese later moved to Rapid City and drew so many people to the pews that Sunday masses at the cathedral offered overflow seating in the gymnasium next door. Is still on the radar of the Lee Police Department and is listed as closed, unsolved. The documents gathered in the case are now in the South Dakota State Archives and Pier. So I do have some other sidelights that just didn't fit anywhere else. I'm just going to throw them here at the end. Um, Police Chief O'Mara of Lee was later hired by the home state mine as a detective. A newspaper report. Where a feature police chief collected guns. Romero mentioned that he one of the pistols he had was the one that was believed to kill Father Belknap. How did the police chief come to possess the pistol that investigators found in the search of Orlando's apartment? Chief Romero gave this interview and then died a few months later, unexpectedly, almost 12 years to the day after Father Belknap's murder. He was given full Masonic right service. The, the son of the woman who found the evidence in Rolando's apartment was a pallbearer at the funeral. Dead end. Okay. Just, I didn't mention that if your phone does go off, it's a $100 donation. Arts <laughs> Council. Exactly. Um, a review of uh, the KKK status uh, in 1921. Um, and that's the indicator of the black hand. I, I got, I've narrowed my suspects down to those two. Uh, in 1921, uh, the KKK was an organization entering into crisis. Their leaders were under investigation for financial and sex crimes, and members began leaving in droves. However, a few days before Father Belknap's murder, a Methodist minister and came a murder of a Catholic priest in Alabama. And this is the clan at the Roundup Ground in Belle Beach. Uh, the motive for this murder in Alabama was fueled by the minister's daughter converting to Catholicism and marrying a Puerto Rican. Since the local priest performed the ceremony, the Methodist minister went to the priest's rectory and shot him on the front porch. And so he was acquitted. And so we know the KKK was active in the Black Hills, and one of their largest national gatherings was right here at the Roundup Grounds. And uh, legacy families in the area purged their reputations of the clan and understandably refused to discuss the activities of their ancestors. So that's, that's kind of a dead end until something is surfaces. Uh, the Black Hand was blamed for many kidnappings. But they weren't prone to killing. One case falsely accused the Black Hand of murdering a San Francisco area priest in early 1921, but the real murderer staged the kidnapping and ransom note to throw the blame on the Black Hand. However, a colleague of mine researching the Black Hand some years ago received a threatening phone call to stop digging. Uh, dead end. So, Whistleblowers um, were widely uh, silenced after they exposed the many high-ranking officials of the U.S. government in the McCarthy era, era. Some documents were selectively released following the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, confirming their accusations. Uh, many uh, official files from U.S. intelligence agencies and the Catholic Church remain sealed and jealously guarded against 
because it's from the hills. However, one piece of good news, in June, I was able to tour the archives of the, the Diocese of Mountain City. They had moved to their new facility, and it took them a while to get ramped up and, and going. But they said, yeah, come on down, and we'll show you what we have and don't have. And so the archives are organized by the bishop. So the bishop's tenure has its own set of shelves. So you just go by uh, Bishop Lawler, pretty scant, even when he was there for a couple decades. Uh, bishop Bush, pretty scant. And some of the more recent bishops, lots of stuff on lots of shelves. So um, they opened it up and said, yep, yeah, here's what we have, here's what we're going to have. We're not hiding anything. And so I'm satisfied with that. You let me walk around and touch stuff and go through things. And so uh, I'm satisfied. I've had college days up in, in the Marquette area and also in Baltimore. So there's potential um, archival materials there, as well as I heard some things were stowed away. Um, in some churches in Minnesota for some reason. I'm not sure why. So I'm going to keep looking. Um, let's see here. Here's another little thing. I had to take credit for Father Belknap's murder a few years after the killing, and authorities took an interest because the priest spent a short time in lead in 1921. However, the confession collapsed as travel records showed that the priest arrived in Lee days after the murder, not before. So other mysterious cases of priests going missing in 1921 and 23 opened up a new round of inquiry. Uh, however, those subsequent cases are. So unless credible evidence or written testimony or some other hidden secret is revealed, the details of the case will remain hidden. Father Belknap is buried at the Mount Olivet Cemetery in Dubuque, Iowa, and it's been 100 years since his murder, but an interest of mine for more than 20 years, so only a simple reason that we could pray for his soul and remember him as a hero of the Catholic Church in the Black Hills. The Diocese of Leeds today, as a bishop of Lead in name only, continues to include the priests and parishioners and the former diocese in his daily prayers from his church in Peoria, Illinois. And so that is concludes my presentation and thank you for coming today. Any questions? If the Black Hand Society was over by Newcastle, what was going on in Newcastle? Were they extensions of Miners from Lead, or what were they doing in Newcastle? Well, there's a train track that goes through there, and we'll get you out of here quick. And um, the, I think it's Flying B. Yeah. Was it at the Flying B? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're right over in there. And so that story about them maybe being in that area, you know, some kind of operation. Well, now, if you're bootleggers, that'd be logical because a lot of people were doing it at that time. So that's something. But there could have been other activities going on, and perhaps they were trying to, to do, a, you know, planning for other things, intimidation, kidnappings, that sort of thing. So I'll try to keep my guts like that. <laughs> So yeah, that's one of the things that would be a base of operations. So if you have people coming and going, you need to hide somebody after a crime in Chicago, get them on a train out here. That was common. So was there a Black Hand Society at home state? Well, we can't prove that. I, I have talked to a person who has the home state personnel records, find some names for you. Um, I don't think you carry a membership card to the Black Hand, so we can't really have that to prove it. But um, associations, uh, Rolando, another one I'm trying to run down is he he went to practice pistol shooting with a lead dentist who was 20 years older than he was. Now, why those two ended up together to practice shooting a pistol, I don't know. 
But what was his role in this to teach him how to shoot a pistol? I don't know. But it was just interesting. So uh, there's a lot of little things that trails you can go off and that don't lead anywhere and come back. And, but from what I could tell, um, like Tom Ryan said, finding out who did it isn't as important maybe as why it was done. And just to kind of remember that this is a case that has never been solved and maybe people can box of stuff. You never know. There's something in there. So just to kind of keep uh, keep that on your on your mind from time to time. Was that really a picture of him when yeah. he died? Where did you get that? Um Bob Lee. Wow. That's how long that is that was a long time ago. Who took the picture? I think That's... it was uh Casper. Okay. Oh, $100. <laughs> <laughs> was it uh, police evidence or was it in a newspaper? It, it, I never saw it in any newspapers at the time because they weren't really equipped for flipping photos around, but it was a photo that was in the, in the state archives. So I think it maybe the police had it and then handed it over. Wow. So I, it would be nice to, to see all of the photos. Photos that they found in the apartment building, but uh, it, it, it was a small town, but it was a big city. I mean, it was the biggest town in South Dakota, I think, maybe at that time or just prior. And so there's a lot of people there, boarding houses, and how the tightly connected the, the maid that found the the evidence. Her son was a pallbearer at the police chief's funeral. Just seems a little interesting. So, so. Do you, in your research, did you, do you detect any lack of enthusiasm by the authorities to investigate this? Or um, I think, from what I can tell, the um, county commission put up a reward, which told me that the government was kind of on the side of finding the killer. Um, mainly, I can imagine walking around town and there's groups of people huddled on the street corner wanted to get some news because they were going to go and exact some revenge. So the tensions were high. I think the police wanted to, to deal with it. But once Orlando disappeared, they, it, was, it went cold real fast. And so uh, the bishop also implored everyone to stand down, let's call this off and not go crazy here. And so enthusiastic, but like I said, um, Four weeks later, they did a, a one-night uh, roundup of all the bootleggers in Lee. They stormed about three or four different homes and businesses and cleaned them out and had a big media event for this. So that was sort of their refocus. They, eh, okay, we could find the murderer. So it was, they, they got tips every now and then, but they all were. Yeah. At that period of time was a very, uh, I know that from news articles, etc., that the KKK was very prevalent in this area, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota. Um, and I, that was the, one of the first things I heard about that murder was that it was the KKK. <laughs> so what, what if it, any of that? Theory. Well, in the over, there were some stories about people that have talked about it. They said, well, was it the KKK or who was it? And they said, well, a lot of these groups overlapped. So if you sometimes your your people that were involved in the Freemasons were also in the KKK. So you had some crossover there. And like the K Clan meetings at church. So they, it wasn't necessarily um, unknown at that time. But they had they stormed another church service in Spearfish. They walked in and wanted to make a presence. And so they came in with their torches and I don't know if it was the, the um, what, what denomination it was, but it wasn't the Catholic Church. And one of the ladies Go home. <laughs> and 
How did you know it was him? Well, I recognized the shoes. Those were the shoes. <laughs> so I think it was a, they were trying to build enthusiasm, and they they did that mainly because it was a racial thing. It was more of an ethnic, right? 100% American, full blood, no loyalties, and so you had a lot of immigrants in this area, and they wanted to declare in charge. So that's why they hated the Catholic Church so much, because they drew a lot of those immigrant families. So, so did the efforts to unionize at the mine happen soon after? Because they it, did it, eventually. It was unionize. shortly after that. It took a so, little while. Um, just stories I've done in the past where the Homestake Opera House knocked down the union fervor. So Phoebe Hurst could say, yeah, I built you this opera house and bowling alley and swimming pool. What the union do for you? It locked you out for two months. And so that's what how Hope State operated. And so they really tried to treat their employees well, but they just were an ulterior motive just to keep it from unionizing. And that was their big fear with Father Donat was that he wanted to make sure that their Catholics got Sunday off and then when they came back to work Sunday night or Monday, they got treated pretty harshly by their co-workers. And so they just decided to go to church or not go to church because they didn't want to take a week's worth of abuse. So were the number of Catholics great I mean the Catholics greatly outnumbered by other church well, combinations? From what we were not affiliated with any denomination. We just wouldn't, we weren't going anywhere. And so they, it was really an evangelization process for all the churches when they moved in over time. And while the Catholic Church came in the 1800s for the Native Americans mainly, they weren't here for the settlers. And later they found that a lot of your homesteaders and things didn't, didn't have that evangelized, but it wasn't wasn't in their schedule, and so they really hard to get people to come consistently. But over time, you know, you see churches built in every town, so it, it takes time, and um, it was a process. Um, so, uh, who replaced Father Belknap and Lee? And how tough of a process was that to get somebody well, else to come? In? There were multiple priests. Already, the Bishop Lawler had just kind of moved people up and, and took that spot. There was a, his last name was Diamond. Uh, Father Diamond was also, um, but they moved him around a little bit and assigned him to different churches around West River. And so um, they coped, and as over time it became, the chancellor became a hired job by a, by a layperson. Was surrounded by multiple priests that could handle a lot of that workload. So, good question. Yeah, good. Thank you. Good eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about World War One? Was there, in in some articles, it's been a reference to blaming, um, like people of the Jewish faith, and for the war, and the efforts of the war that America. I had just of these kinds of people, and they were German Catholic and that kind of thing. Did that enter into that Ku Klux Klan? Did you see any evidence of that kind of discussion in lead or in their gatherings? Well, yeah, they had uh, certainly the German people took a, the worst of it. Yeah, the war. yeah. But uh, and there were some Germans out in mainly North Dakota. All oh, that yeah. community settled. So uh, lead was a lot of Italians and, and uh, Eastern Europeans. So it was Europe, really. Yeah. So it, it wasn't necessarily a big German contingent, but there were some Germans and Russians down in, in Vail in that area, but they were even segregated. They didn't associate with each other. And that may not have been a clan thing, it was just a nationality thing. So Did they, they actually burn? 
Mm-hmm. Cross we did that in Moorhead and Fargo, North Dakota, and Grand Forks. We read about yeah. that. There was a cross burn on the lawn of the Black Hill State. Really? The president was a Catholic. So they wanted to send a message that we're here. So um, I'm not sure when that happened, but it was sometime in that area. So I'd like, I'm Chuck Rambo's presentation history of the KKK. He gave a presentation out at the Pizza Ranch one time before they had uh, remodeled. There was a dividing wall at the big glass doors. We were there, and of course, he has a uh, the KKK regalia that. Come fall back there, and the doors were closed. And he gave his presentation, and he's pointing to this. When we came out, some of the folks up at the till said that they had comments with, "What in the Sam Hill is going on back there?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not something you just want to walk down the street with. Probably put it in a yeah, uh, yeah. Right. Right. yeah he's. That was our own thing, I didn't know. And so yeah. that could still happen today. And I know that there were, he's told stories about families that found stuff and immediately burned it, destroyed it, didn't want to associate with their family anymore. And that's understandable. Yeah. But uh, I am a fan of the presence that tape, and it is, it is it's eerie. Yeah, if you're not there's, used to, to seeing it, and there's something about it that's just. And it's fallen out of favor kind of permanently in the American landscape. But we hope. You hope. Yeah. I just say that because there's other places that other things arise and it maybe isn't in the clan room, but there's other things that come up. But, so it, it's kind of had its ups and downs since yeah. the Civil War. It comes and goes. Yeah. So. Okay, on behalf of the Area Arts Council, we'd like to present you with a little gift. Oh, and yeah. thank you so much. We hope you'll come back again and do another one of your talks. Tell us what's in the, what have you got going for new talks? Well, the new, next one I'm trying to work on, it's just in the early days, but uh, is Neva Plummer, Neva Esme. Um, okay. She was, uh, I think, an overlooked person. In the Black Hills. Yeah, she was a first commercial pilot, female commercial pilot in South Dakota. Wow. And was an instrumental in helping save that guy that landed on top of Hill's Tower in 1941. <laughs> and so Clyde Ice got all credit that she deserved a lot too. So she was the one doing all the work. She was listed as a bookkeeper. Her never was a dish, but she was actually a licensed pilot. She did training during World War II, showed people how to pack parachutes, and then went on to be the Butte County superintendent of schools. Oh, yeah, she and our grade school. Did a lot of things. And so, but her early life, before she got married, she did some pretty heroic things. And I thought, dang it, you know, maybe uh, she's not even been in the Hall of Fame over in Spearfish. So maybe that should be. So that's my next thing. Yay, very good. Her daughter, and she's okay with it, good to go, but just have to. Um, I do all the work. She just said, I have boxes if you want to go through it. <laughs> but she also, I think, she killed a moose and donated it, the head to the Butte County Courthouse. And that's the one that hung in there for years and years and years. Now it's gone. I'm trying to track that down. <laughs> so you attack a moose. If I can find it. Well, thank you, Tim. Thank you all very much. I just want to mention that our pro- we don't have a program in December, but in January, <coughs> third Friday, fall o'clock, Robert Dennis from Red Owl will be here. And if you like cowboy music, he's going to sing a couple cowboy songs. He might do some cowboy poetry. <coughs> and he will...
also as an orphan child from Switzerland. Wow. Fascinating story. And uh, I'm looking forward to that, and I hope you can all join us then. If you have any ideas on possible programs, <coughs> contact Richard or I. Richard, you got something you want to say? Anything I forgot? Okay. Isn't he, isn't that nice to have someone who just says, well, thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you.